Hi, I'm Greg Braxton at the Los Angeles Times, and we're here talking today with Frida Pinto, the star of Gorilla, the Showtime series, which just had its finale uh, Sunday night. Uh, miniseries from John Ridley that was fierce, provocative, and uh, pretty uncompromising. And so was the performance by Frida. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Welcome. Thanks so much for doing this. Thank you just so have much. to ask you, are you okay? Because <laughs> judging <I'm> cool. <laughs> just just judging from the whole trajectory of this project, mm. we were in fear for your character the, right. the entire time. Right. Like like John wrote wonderfully in the script in the in the first episode and ends it pretty much on the same note but with a shift in power you know I am so fucking cool yeah <laughs> so very very nice what was before we get into the specifics what was this whole experience like for you right um, you know for me first of all I love doing being part of projects where I get to learn something uh, where I'm not just playing myself where I get to kind of pull myself out of my own comfort zone, but also learn something about a time in history that really informs who I am today, or you know, talk about certain decisions that people have had to make or are making at the moment as well that are always under pressure. So when I first read uh, the pilot episode, episode one, I realized that jazz was a, like you use the word uncompromising, a very uncompromising kind of character with a, you know, with a, with a real sense of her, her own purpose. Um, and the, the rest of the episodes, even though I hadn't read it, you know, knowing that it was in the safe hands of John Ridley, I just knew that that purpose was just going to get strengthened with every episode. So I did not have the fear of somewhere dwindling away just because I hadn't read the remaining five episodes. Um, so for me, it was just exploration after exploration, day after day, with John Ridley on the first two episodes, then with Sam uh, Miller on episodes three, four, and five. Uh, and then, of course, when John came back for six. And with every cast member, Babu Sise, who I call my true partner in crime, you know, without him, what we were able to create for Gorilla would have been absolutely impossible. Uh, the two of us really came together as a team, really exploring not just a political time in Britain's history in, um, uh, with the British Black Panther movement, but really about relationships and about people and what happens to those relationships when they're under pressure. Um, so, yeah, the whole experience of it, though, though seeped in politics and history, was very much about, you know, you and I, about two people coming together. So to explain, you play Jazz, yes. Mitra, who is a revolutionary. The series is set during the backdrop of the British Black Power Movement in 1971. How did you even get involved with this in the, in the beginning? Um, I, the, the, the traditional way, you know, the script was around, my uh, managers happened to read it um, before the casting process had even started. And uh, they called me up and they said, there's this character that John Ridley, this, uh, this, this script that John Ridley is working on, a mini-series. Um, and for the first time, um, I don't think you need to change this character from a white woman to suit you or from another ethnicity or another color, color of skin to suit you. It's just written for someone like you, and I think you should go and explore it. And I was like, John Ridley, hell yeah, I'm going to go and explore it. Uh, so I read the first, uh, the pilot episode, and like I said, the first thing I was like, wait a minute, this, how come this, all of this happened in history and I had no clue that it has um, gone by? Um, and so I met John Ridley to, to um, find out more about this really volatile, very important time in, in Britain's history, and actually world history as well, in a way. Um, and that's pretty much how I got involved. I did the, like I said, the traditional casting process where I had to read for the, for the character and got the part fair and square. And uh, after that, everything is what you see on Showtime. <laughs> what connection did you feel with, with Jazz? Because obviously you felt mm. some kind of affinity with her. Yeah, I think one of the things I really, really appreciated uh, about the way John wrote Jazz is even though she's this powerful character, this strong character, she's got her own sets of vulnerabilities, which don't go against her as her weakness. They're really her strength. And that's one of the things as an actor and as a, as a, as a woman in this industry, I have been trying to find for such a long time. And I use this analogy, it's like standing in a room full of people who are supposed to be your supporters and your colleagues and your peers, and you're screaming on the top of your lungs, but this is my voice and I wanna be heard. 
and no one seems to be listening till finally, you know, one fine day John comes along and, and realizes that. And in many ways, I feel jazz is the exact same. In this room full of people who are supposed to be her, her comrades, who are supposed to be her supporters, you know, part of the cell. And every step of the way, there is this moment of her being sidelined to the point that she has to find her own ways to reiterate her power, to reinforce who she is in that group. And I feel this is uh, probably the experience of many women. It's not just me. Um, and I kind of like that, that very, um, with subtlety, John brings us into Gorilla as well. The other thing I really could relate to when, with jazz and with me is this, 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 this um, need to constantly want to do something, you know, to not just be a talker. And I feel sometimes that might translate into the lack of patience and strategy, uh, which sometimes I fall prey to as well. When I'm really passionate about something, I, I kind of just see red and I go for it. And I think that's jazz in a way as well. So in so many ways, I feel like jazz um, helped me calm down, even though she's not a calming character. Right, right. <laughs> but she kind of mirrored, uh, it was a mirror image of, you know, in, in, in certain spots of who I can possibly become and what it really, uh, how people receive it. So yeah, I kind of felt like I learned so much from this character just for life in general. You spoke about sort of being in a room and wanting to be heard and, and not people not paying as much attention to you as you would like. Most of us know you prior from Gorilla to the Slumdog Millionaire. Yes. Um, and you've spoken about how even though that was a wonderful experience and a great launch to your career, there was also another side to that. Mm -hmm. and what, what was that? There's this line in Slumdog Millionaire that uh, Dev Patel's character Jamal Malik, Malik says, says when he's on the game show, uh, not on the game show, sorry, when he's in the interrogation uh, process, and he goes, she's the most beautiful girl in the world. And I <laughs> literally thought to myself at that point in time, that line could be a blessing or a curse because I don't want to be seen the way everybody now will want to box me or stereotype me as. So what happened post Slumdog was it was a real high and a real high to start on. I don't think, I can't think of many people who start on that kind of a high. Um, but I came in without any prior experience, without any, you know, uh, there wasn't a warming up process. It literally, you went, I went right to the you heat. You were just thrown It's just going right into the deep end. Um, uh, so I wasn't prepared really for the, the pitfalls as a, that this industry, you know, forces you to go towards. So there was a real stereotype to you? Terrible, terrible stereotyping at, in the beginning. And I had to do a lot of work to stay away from it. So it was the choice of films, for example. I had to be so careful that right off the bat of Slumdog, I did not go into something that just exoticized me, just made me like this exotic creature. Uh, and I chose to do films like the Julian Schnabel film Miral and the Woody Allen film, which is kind of a little bit of an exotic character, but still an indie project that I could, you know, just, just stretch myself a little bit. Um, but then there were still the pitfalls. You know, I did play the characters where I played the cardboard cutout character, which wasn't the intention to begin with. Uh, and then I found it hard to step out of it because that's what everybody saw me as for a bit. Um, it took a lot of uh, co a conscious decision to go silent for a bit and to put myself into this forced state of anxiety um, where I said, okay, I'm not gonna say yes to every project that comes my way, which translated into not working for two and a half years. How hard was that for you? Horrible. It was like, you know, when you talk about self-inflicted suffering, that was what I would call it. However, um, through that suffering, I also learned that you find your strengths. And I started producing in those two and a half years of going really quiet. There were stories that I really wanted to tell as a as an actor and as a as a creator, as someone with you know as a creative artist. And so I started producing during that time. I uh, found my voice in other forms of expression, activism being one of them. And it got stronger and stronger over time, which kind of all informed jazz by the time she came around. Um, so yes, I would say that that wasn't, I, I, don't, I think for any actor, just not working for two and a half years can be a horrible experience because as is when you're working, you constantly wonder, uh, is this the last gig I'm ever gonna get? You know, is my career over after this? Mm -hmm. um, and then imagine not working and having that voice only that much louder in your head. So yeah, no, it wasn't 
a fun process, but I have now also accepted the fact that if it's happened once, it can very much happen again. It just means that when I go in it, go in at it again, I will be a little more informed and probably stronger to deal with it. I wanted to read something that John Ridley said about you when um, he was casting you for this part. He said, in addition to being a very talented person, Frida is also very passionate. I know she spent time working with activist causes and working with underprivileged children all over the world. She has a way of speaking with passion, but not anger. Oh, bless him. <laughs> <laughs> so obviously you two not only clicked, but he saw the potential in you that others were not automatically seeing. Yeah, and I, I truly, truly owe it to him for this gift that he gave me. Um, it took someone like him to have the patience and the openness to just meet me once outside of the whole, um, before Gorilla even got, was cast, to just hear me out and to hear what, I, what it is that I had to say. And then of course I had to bring it on in the, you know, bring my A game in the, in the audition process as well. So was that intimidating knowing that this is your shot and you've got to hit it and if you do, you're going to be in this marvelous project, but I, what happens? I think I was hungry by then and so I kind of almost had these blinders on, on as to who else they were looking at, who else they were about to cast, what else they had in mind. I literally wanted to hear nothing of that. It was just me and Jazz and making sure that the performance that I put on tape was the one that they would like. You know, So I kind of felt 10 times more determined, not overconfident, but determined and focused than ever before. So I think I eliminated my own, the own sense, my own sense of pressure that I would put on myself in a moment like that, um, which I have to say, I haven't been able to sustain that, that feeling. You know, it's mm. so easy to, you know, things happen and then you move on and you kind of forget. I was under so much, um, but so much fear and anxiety of never working again. And now that I've got the job, sometimes now when I go into auditions and I'm going to a read through, I forget that pressure that uh, I was under when I was not working, you know? So it's nice to kind of constantly just sit back and remind yourself what it feels like to be so ultimately focused that nothing else around you affects you. Things do affect me even today. So what was it like, what homework did you do to get into this character? Because you have such a specific way of looking, your walk, your wardrobe, I mean, everything is just so specific to the demeanor and seriousness and fierceness of this character. Yeah, I, I, I actually call that teamwork because it's not. It wasn't. It wouldn't have been possible for me alone to go out there and find her walk. Um, even though there's a lot of work that I do with my characters on her, their physicality way before I start filming, I felt like it was important that I f that I put my feet in the shoes that Jazz would wear in that time period. That I put that jacket on, the suede jacket that I have throughout the six episodes and feel its restrictive quality to see how I would actually then find my, my own movement within it or my, you know, my high-waisted uh, flare-bottom uh, right. jeans that I was wearing. Um, so the costume played a very, very important part. And every morning, um, no matter what scene I was filming, the first thing that would take me out of who I am um, as, a, you know, as who everybody else is, which is Frida, uh, as soon as I put the costume on, it was game over for Frida and it was like, okay, in, in, comes, in, in comes jazz. So costume played a big, big role. Um, but in terms of like hair and makeup, um, John didn't want anything, you know? He was like, I don't care what, you know, they think you should look like. I don't see jazz, she's a revolutionary. She has no time to groom. There's no time for hair and makeup. I just want minimal, like such minimal work, to the point that Holly, who is Holly Edwards, my makeup artist, started actually having to um, um, make me look more sick and tired because mm. of you know the hours of the hours that she was spending in a dark room or without proper food and running water, and I think all of that really helped, and which is why I say it's really teamwork, you know. Even though I'm not physically feeling that tired, the fact that I look tired just would make me act tired. Um, so yeah, it was, a, it was a lot of fun actually bringing that physicality into characters, which is the one thing I love. I remember playing this, um, I ble being in this film with Michael Winterbottom where I played this character named Trishna, who's from um, um, the rural parts of India. And you know, it was a simple move from shoulders straight to shoulders 
forward that changed the her entire demeanor to the point that after I finished filming, I've had so much trouble just holding my shoulders back because I played this this kind of submissive character in a way in Trishna that it, that that physicality was so important. Um, so yeah, I'm I'm really glad that I got to spend some time ahead of the actual filming to find her to find this physicality. So when Jazz also her her political views are very very straightforward but she also seems to have a complicated relationship with men and sort of mm -hmm. almost reflecting what you've gone through personally in mm -hmm. terms of how people see you can you talk a little bit about that because men the men that she, are attracted to her have a very specific perception of her that doesn't necessarily have to do with her or, or with what, how she wants to be perceived, right. you know, that's, that, that's so true. And I feel that, like I said, is not just Jazz's story or my story. It's a story of quite a few women. And there are some women who enjoy it, you know, so who, who want to be seen as that, what mm -hmm. everyone else perceives them as. And, and you know, I don't want to be uh, sounding ungrateful or, uh, uh, or someone who is not happy with the way I look. I'm really happy and I'm, I'm, I thank my parents for the genetics <laughs> part of it but that is not who I that is not the only thing I am you know I'm beyond my looks and I think jazz is the exact same she when she tells Kent that's you know you always reduce me to my looks I'm more than just my looks I have a voice I have intelligence and smarts that I can use as well in in a situation like a revolution or just to make myself heard I can use my own voice don't just get don't just stop at the face um, so, I, but jazz specifically, I feel, and this is why I, you know, John Ridley is so amazing at writing this with subtlety. Not only does she experience that in her past relationship with Kent, played by Idris Elba, but she very much faces it within the in-group as well, where it's constantly uh, a, a remark or a, um, um, well, I just say a jibe made at her, her sexuality by the other team members. Not so mm -hmm. much Marcus, because Marcus really right. gets it. Uh, but definitely uh, Brandon's character, Leroy, and Nathaniel Martello White's character, Dahari, as well. Mm -hmm. But she's constantly being undermined because she is a woman and she looks a certain way. Um, and I don't even think it's because she looks a certain way. I think it's simply because she's a woman. She's the only woman. She's the only woman in the right. underground cell. Um, and Jazz has, a complicated, has complicated relationships with men, just going back to her backstory with her father being in prison and not having a real father figure. So her instinct is to want to have these people not just look at her as a piece of meat, but to look at her as, as someone of real value, which is why it infuriates her every time she's with Kent and, and Dahari, uh, when they don't see her for what she can potentially bring to this group that could aid the revolution. Um, so yeah, I kind of, I enjoyed playing that as well because that's something I hear a lot of women complain about even at their workplace in modern day world. We don't have to go back to 1970s for that. Um, and for me, that was uh, a representation of sorts that I could bring something to. Now, even though you've received some really excellent reviews for Gorilla, there's also been a bit of controversy of course. <laughs> re revolving around your casting that mm. before the series came out, some people expressed real concerns that an Asian woman was the focal point of a drama that's supposed to be about a British black power movement mm -hmm. and they went after John and they went after you mm -hmm. so can you discuss sort of the process of, of your feeling about that yeah. clouding gorilla in the, in the very beginning? You know yeah it kind of felt in a way that that did suck the air out of the room a little bit you know especially when it was just about to come out in the UK and Funnily enough, uh, I never even thought that could be the criticism. The criticism that I thought was going to come our way was how radical and and um, how radical the revolutionaries were um, were painted as. Because this is again a what if drama, you know, it's not real, mm -hmm. it's still fiction. But I was really worried that people would be would blur the lines between uh, reality and fiction and think this is that we're actually portraying right, the real story. life gorillas. Right. Um, but I was really surprised that that was not the that was not the focal point at all for them, for their argument. It was my, m me being cast as Jazz in the lead role in right. Gorilla. Um, and to what J John said earlier, I found myself not getting angry, but I found myself trying to understand 
what it is that they're really getting at. And the only thing that I could draw my conclusion, you know, where I could draw my conclusion was, it almost seems uh, unproductive and uh, counterproductive for one ethnic minority group to target another ethnic minority group for being misrepresented or underrepresented without understanding that historically in the black power movement or the black, British Black Panther movement, um, there were Asians, um, uh, Africans from the various colonies, Caribbeans from the colonies of, of, uh, of England that all came to, uh, to England for, in the hopes of a better life. So it was not just one color of the skin. It was, and wasn't even the color of the skin. You know, there was this term political blackness that people are now afraid to use because it's been, you know, <laughs> through the show, you show that it's not just the color of the skin. It's really people who are fighting against oppression who come together, black being the color of oppression. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, it was, I could, the only thing that I could understand and what I empathize towards is the lack of education the lack of not knowing that this actually happened at, in a time in history. Um, and I feel completely unapologetic about playing the character because I feel for me it's an honor to be playing someone representing all ethnic minority groups and not just the color black. But the fact that people just came after this before they even checked it out. Yeah. I mean, it Like just... I said, the lack of education, the lack of, you know, just being able to sit back for a minute and not let your own anger come in the way. And I wasn't going to let the same happen to me. You know, it's so easy to get angry and come up, come back at them with all my facts that I have in line and say, do you know who Farooq Dondi is? Do you know who this person is? And I was like, that's not the point here. The point is to be, to encourage them to watch it for as long as I can, encourage them to go and, you know, educate themselves more on this time, this very crucial time in history and the fact that it was a very all-inclusive revolution, revolutionary movement, and also to help them have an open mind about, this is TV, crying out loud. This is not real life. If you already have a problem with an Asian woman playing the lead on television, do you not understand what, you're what, what it says about how you can be in real life with a, 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 an Asian sitting in front of you? Mm -hmm. And so I kind of felt like this is a check into yourself moment, you know, and not just for me, but for everyone. Um, that we always have this, this thing in our head about the other. And I feel like the own, that's the point where we constantly make that mistake. You know, we're always faltering at the word other. When we stop seeing the other, it just becomes so much easier to include people. And then you'll be more open about going out there and doing your research. So how has being a gorilla, how do you feel this has changed the perception of you and what kind of reaction are you getting? I think people are certainly surprised. Uh, they had no idea that I could bring forth this range. And I and actually, I say this quite openly because, you know, it's something that I've been hoping and wanting to b bring out there for, desperately rather, bringing out, br to bring out there and put out there for a very long time. So I think the, the, f the range factor is definitely something that I'm finally hearing people say, right from casting directors to producers. And really, those are the people that are going to give me my next job, right? So, right? so I'm glad that the people who really need to be watching it have seen it and, uh, and are enjoying it. And, um, and a part of it is you know, about timing as well. Uh, I don't know if I could have done this right after Slumdog. I needed to do, be, you know, I o say it all, always, I needed to do the whole knocking around, not really having opportunities, um, you know, being rejected. I needed to go through all of that in order to arrive at this. Um, so yeah, hopefully this does change it, you know, that it also makes it easier for other ethnicities to come forth in the lead to play meaningful characters like this in film and television. I have some other non-gorilla questions okay. to ask you. Um, we have sort of this lightning rod round where we ask certain offbeat questions of mm -hmm. people. So what was the last show you binge watched? Um, it, is, it isn't complete, but up until now, I'm caught up. Uh, Handmaid's Tale. Okay. Uh, I'm caught up to, with up until episode seven. Yeah. So, how are you feeling about that? I, I needed, oh, I needed time to decompress after I watched the last episode, um, which was literally last night. Um, I am slightly fearful that it, I, I'm, not, I'm not saying everything right. that they, you know, are portraying in Handmaid's Tale, and I don't want to be putting any, any spoilers out there in case people haven't caught up yet. Um, 
but it made me a little fearful that this is what we're headed towards anyway, and this is just an amplified, exaggerated version of, of what is actually happening already in the world. Uh, the performances, of course, like there's not a single performance I can say that is weak at all. I mean, right from Elizabeth Moss to Yvonne Strahovski, who literally is my, um, my, my girl crush every day, but also someone I think will be my new best friend. Um, <laughs> just putting it out there, Yvonne. Uh, and um, and um, uh, Joseph, who's so amazing in, in his role as a commander. I just feel like all of them, it almost seems like one of those 1984 allegorical <laughs> novels that they actually st they stand for someone that we probably can go and say, mm, I know that character, he exists yeah. in either politics or some walk of life where they've been given this power to speak. So yeah, um, very, made me, <laughs> made me need a moment to just decompress. <laughs> a powerful, powerful show. And uh, the other show that I watched was Big Little Lies. Okay. Which, uh, to be really honest, when I first started with the first couple of episodes, I was like, this show is going to be super shallow if it's only going to talk about rich people. And then by the time I finished episode one and I realized that they're really not even dealing with just the richness, but really the complexities of this character. It was such a beautifully told, uh, sto um, uh, done show, telling not just what's on the surface, but going really, really deep within and gradually just like giving it out there little by little, you know. So that was another show that I really liked. Yeah, and again, performances. Nicole Kidman was just spectacular in it. Um, what show, what classic TV show do you absolutely love? Friends. <laughs> <laughs> Can I okay. call it classic? <laughs> those you know I was at this event recently and it is a very troubling time in history in general but when you go to these events and it was a women's event a women related event and of course with everything that is happening the speeches become that much more um, intense. intense and and dense almost you know like it's just like hard to kind of go like I just need a little bit of breathing room and make a little way th your way through it and I came back from it feeling so heavy, and I turned on my telly, and they had uh, <laughs> re episode reruns of, of oh, Friends. Friends, and I watched it, and for that moment, it just made me feel better, that we can get through this. And I know it sounds so silly, but that's what you need sometimes. Some, oh, sometimes you just need that lighter moment, and somehow Friends provides it. <laughs> Perfect. I never would have uh, figured that out. Yeah. Did you watch it when it was on? Yeah, I did watch it when it's on, but it's one of those that I can keep watching right. those episodes over and over again and, you know, quote things that also happen in those episodes. But we were on a break. Yes. <laughs> um, well, once again, um, congratulations on Gorillaz. A wonderful performance and uh, the whole project and hope it'll lead to great things for you. Thank you. For more of these chats, please go to latimes.com, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you.